Welcome, welcome to the very first episode of season five of the Runners Roundtable. This is my informal season where it's going to be all about hot takes, just discussing things that are happening within the running community, things that I feel need a deeper dive than a graphic on Instagram or a comment here or there, things that I feel are how do I say just topics that are preventing running from being more inclusive maybe is is maybe where I'll start with. So today we are going to be talking about the Boston Marathon and I am so, so thrilled to be joined by Becky Croft and Steph Dunlap and both of you. Well, Becky, I feel like you've been such a guiding light for me and since I met you. I can't tell you how many people you've connected me with. So to have you on the podcast is just, it's an honor for me and stuff. I have been, and I think we talked about it when you were on the episode, just for me, I have been on this journey of redefining what it means to be a runner and reminding myself that there's no one way to be a runner. There are so many ways to be a runner. And that the minute I start boxing myself in a certain way, it's because I'm letting the gatekeepers (laughs) of running determine who I am as a runner, which just isn't cool. So that's been my own personal work of coming into who I am as a runner at this time and being really, really proud of that. So before we get into this discussion, I would like both of you to introduce yourselves. And Becky, we're going alphabetical order right now. First name, (laughs) if you can start by introducing yourself to us, tell us a little bit about what you do and what's your favorite thing about running? (laughs) Okay. So I am Becky Croft. I am, um, a diverse human. I am indigenous, um, a coach, an athlete myself, but I also am an advocate for people like me who are outliers in the running industry. Um, I kind of thought that was like a, a dirty word there for a while, but I'm learning how to embrace that and teach my athletes how to do the same. Um, I do that through our Game Changers program, um, also through Renew Earth Running. I'm a board member, um, and I like to share different perspectives on running, and that gets people a little <laughs> uh, riled up from time to time. But I think my favorite thing about running overall is that it can be anything and everything you truly want it to be. There is no certain criteria to be a runner. Yeah. Steph? Steph Dunlap. Um, I like to say that I'm a marathon pacer and your number one cheerleader. Marathon pacing is often what I do on the weekends. Um, but during the week, I'm an elementary school vice principal. I'm also a mom of two little girls. So sometimes when people see me pacing marathons, once a month, if not several times a month, they think that's my full-time job, but it's not. But truly, it's my passion and my joy to um, advocate for the back of the pack because I often pace the six-hour marathon. Like Those people are my people. And in fact, Stephanie, I have to just give you kudos because when I was on your podcast, you encouraged me to start my own podcast to tell the inspiring stories of the runners that I meet in that six-hour marathon group. And so since being on your podcast, I have launched the Run Strong Run podcast podcast to tell these inspiring stories of, again, these people in the six-hour marathon pacing group that I have the privilege and the joy of sharing 26.2 miles with. And truly, I'm a better human, a better mom, a better runner because of these people that I have the privilege of pacing to the finish line. So there you go, Steph Dunlap, marathon pacer, and your number one cheerleader to say that all runners count. And what's your favorite thing about running? Oh, man. Ah. Favorite thing about running? I love a good challenge. And in fact, recently I just paced a half marathon. And so if if six hour full marathon is like my sweet spot, like three hour half marathon is usually my sweet spot. But this, uh, this recently, I just paced a half marathon, the two hour, 30 minute group. And I was, I was scared. I was scared to pace that I've paced it in the past, but, um, I, I decided I would give it a go and it was not on a super easy course. So I think what I love about running is there are days where you go out there and running 
it sucks. It's, it's hard. Like, you know, it may, it might not go exactly how you plan. There's other days you go out there and you crush your goal and you feel just like elated running. You can run when you're happy. You can run when you're sad. Running is like therapy running shows you that you're capable of so much more than you can ever dream or imagine. So I, I, I can't just say that running, there's one, one thing I love so much about running. Yeah. Listen, I, I find that my relationship to running changes a lot depending on the weather. So if the weather's great, I'm like, running's awesome. If the weather is hot and humid, like it's been the past few days, I am questioning my sanity of why do I do this thing called running when I am in, not, I'm not in tears. I exaggerate. Okay. I exaggerate people, but running in the heat really brings me, <laughs> brings me to my knees. It, it just, it breaks my spirit, but not my soul. So I feel you when you say that. So this episode, this hot takes episode is about the Boston Marathon. And I know if you're listening to this and you're a runner, it's every year I feel like we hear a lot about the qualifying times. We hear about the front end of the race in terms of how many people don't get into the race because there was the cutoff. But this year, it was the opposite. And a lot of the discussion that came up afterwards was about the six hour cutoff and how there were over 500 people who finished the race who are not considered official finishers because they didn't meet that six hour cutoff. So Steph, I have a question for you. Just when you pace the six hour group, because I think this is something that people fail to understand when does your time start for that six hour? Like, are you ending the course? Are you not ending the course? I guess that was one of the first things that I heard people were really confused as to when that six hour cutoff started and then when it ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So usually a, a course cutoff begins like when the last runner crosses that starting line that like that six hour starts now there are races where actually the six hour cutoff is, is based upon the clock so when the race starts so for example big sur which i just paced the uh cutoff time for big sur marathon recently um, they have a pretty strict six hour cutoff. And as the six hour pacer, I also kind of like acted as sweeper. And so I had to be very clear on what my role was because was, was the six hour cutoff time starting when the last run across that starting line was the six hour cutoff starting at clock time, because if it started in clock time and I don't cross until 10 minutes after the clock starts, like that first person crosses the starting line, I'm no longer the six hour pacer. I'm the five hour, 50 minute pacer. And so I I think for um, race directors or, or even runners, they need to be clear on that because those people who are running to, to get that, to make it in time for that six hour cutoff, because people in the back of the pack, usually they're well aware of that cutoff time. And that's what they're running to do is they're running to beat that cutoff time because they want that official finish time. And they definitely want that finisher medal. I mean, those 26.2 miles, blood, sweat, and tears, they want that medal when they cross that finish line. Okay. I'm going to ask, hopefully not a controversial question, but I feel like we hear it all the time. Steph, but like six hours, you're not working as hard as someone who's ran it in three and a half hours, four hours. Can you speak to us about that? Uh, there's nothing that riles me up more than people making that comment because let's let's define hard. What, what what does hard mean? Working hard. And recently, how I responded to someone on 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 Instagram who replied to that about oh those six hour people who who are boasting a six hour finish that's that's nothing to to tout. I say until you are side by side with these people for six hours for cheering that the course for 26.2 miles and you see how hard they're working and you hear their story, you are not, you cannot speak to how hard um, they have worked to reach that finish line because I do get to share these miles with these, these runners and believe me too, pacing six hours, it's never easy. And I'm proud of every single one of my finish times, whether it's six hours or I've also paced or I've swept a full marathon at seven hours, five minutes. And let me tell you, that is not easy. And I am working hard to be out on my feet, moving forward for six, seven hours. 
Yeah. And I think that's something that I always find really interesting when people say something about six hours, because I'm like, do you not understand that you're on your feet for six hours versus four hours or whatever the time is? Do you not also understand that your entire fueling strategy has to be completely different if you're running for six hours, if you're moving your body for six hours? Now, Becky, you had, and I can't remember when you posted this, but you posted something that talked about the different experiences of people on the course, depending on where you start on the course. So those elite runners are going to have one course experience, front of the pack runners, another, middle of the pack, another, and then back of the pack, totally different experience. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, I mean, I was snapping, I loved it. And I was curious also just What prompted you to create that? Because I feel like I really do feel like some people, not all, but I feel like some people have a really hard time with putting themselves in other people's shoes and seeing beyond their own experience of a race to think of, oh, people who are behind me are going to experience a totally different course then what I'm experiencing or even the people in front of me are experiencing a different course. So can you talk to us a little bit about, I guess, that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the people who downplay anybody else's experience lack empathy is really what it comes down to. It's It could be like an entitled mindset, but I think they just truly lack empathy. And as I continue to grow and develop my own mindset and, you know, my own personal development in every way, shape and form, I start looking at other people's perspectives more. And that's something that I kind of was exploring while I'm seeing all these terrible comments all over (laughs) social media about Boston all the way around. But when I think about it, I look at these images of Des Linden or any of the other elites, sub-elites, and there aren't a million cups on the ground. There's hydration for them. They have their own special table and bottles for their hydration. They know those bottles are going to be there. Now it's up to them to make sure that they grab them and that they consume them and that they fuel when they need to fuel. But when it comes to the rest of the pack behind them, has the water run out? Do they have the gels? Have the tables been picked up? Like, is there support? Are there people cheering for them? Like everybody's there cheering for the elites. The elites make the news. They are celebrated all over the place, but the outliers are not. They don't have the same support. They don't have the same issues. And this is something that I really, truly noticed when I was in Berlin. So Mm -hmm. I ran Berlin in 2019, pouring rain, like they were doing an experiment with the cups. They were trying to be a little more environmentally friendly, but the cups were like the hard plastic and they wanted you to put them in the bins, but the bins were overflowing. And so it's already like, you, you don't have traction from your shoes because it's wet, but then you're slipping and sliding on cups. But the elites don't have that problem. They have an advantage. The sub-elites have an advantage and they don't even recognize that or they expect to have it because they're fast. Yeah, that is something that really struck me. And I experienced that for myself earlier this year. I, I My annual race is the Miami Half Marathon. And I started off really strong <laughs> and then I just faded because it was hot. It's hot. I just don't do well with hot. And by the time I reached mile seven and a half, they had run out of water at that particular stop. And I just, you know, you know, when you have that moment of panic of, oh, this, this support, this on-course support isn't there. And then sure enough, by the time I got to mile nine, everyone was stopped at mile nine because they were finally able to get water. And I remember talking to friends afterwards and they're like, oh yeah, I did experience that. I sailed right through, I got water, no problem. And in at that very moment, I realized, oh, they had a different experience, which is why Becky, your post spoke so much to me because 
I experienced that myself of talking to my friends the exact same race and they were maybe half an hour ahead of me, probably not even more than 15 minutes ahead of me. But by the time I reached that point in the course, they were already ahead. They didn't face that not having water or that backlog of runners to get water. And it, I mean, it really, it, it shifted the race for me. Like that made the race just, just a more challenging race. And I think there is something to be said about that, because again, we don't think about it, especially when you're thinking about a race like Boston or even Berlin, right? Where you have tens of thousands of participants on the course. And I'm, I'm sure both of you have ran through races where you can't even see the ground. All you see are paper cups, paper cups and water littered. And you can't even, I, I have to slow down because I'm so paranoid that I'm going to slip and fall. So I'm sure both of you have experienced that. And I guess my next question is, Becky, you were at Boston this year and you ran it this year. So can you walk us through what your experience as a runner was on the course this year with things like the support or how many people you were surrounded by, how many people are ahead of you, behind you, anything to kind of paint the picture to what we're talking about right now. Yeah. And I think that my experience is a little bit unique here because I ran on behalf of Native Women Running. And Verna is working, the founder of Native Women Running, is working very hard to amplify Indigenous women in the running space because there's serious lack of diversity when it comes to running. And she was given a spot maybe two, three, four weeks before she approached me. And so she reached out to her leadership team, offered a spot to one of them. And, but she kept, you know, asking Boston, can I have some bibs here? Like we need some native runners. Heartbreak Hill is named after a native runner. If you didn't know that, mm. um, a lot of the indigenous history when it comes to this race is erased. But so she, um, actually reached out to me about applying for a spot with rising hearts. And it was just like, maybe days after I had finished Ventura in February. And so I was like, no, no, I'm not going to apply for that. I'll let somebody else have that spot. Like three marathons this year would really wreck me. <laughs> and because like Ventura was a goal race and then I'm going to be in Chicago. So she's like, okay, okay. Well, then she asked me to have a phone call with her. And she told me that, okay, we we have another spot. And I was like, oh, okay, who do you want me to support? Because I tried to support indigenous athletes. I thought I'll donate a plan. I'll get them there. But I was like, listen, we're a little close. We're six weeks away. And she's like, no, Becky, the leadership team wants you. Mm. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so now I have six weeks to get ready for a marathon. When I've just, I'm in the middle of my deload for my last one. So BAA really failed Native women running in this, the way that they approached it. They were like, oh, yeah, well, here's another bib. But I still had to pay to get there. And mm -hmm. that in itself was a whole situation. I mean, NWR tried to help me, but this wasn't something that like they really had budget for. So I was like, okay, this means a lot more to me than anything because I have a relationship with NWR and supporting six of their athletes at New York last year was a big deal. So they're repaying me by giving me this opportunity to go represent indigenous runners. And I was like, okay, this, this is a, a bigger deal than just qualifying. I'm exceptionally close to qualifying. It doesn't really matter if I do that or not. That's my goal. And I have my reasons for wanting to do it, but in being able to represent indigenous athletes, I was able to go do that. So <laughs> getting there and going through the expo and, you know, getting ready for the race and all of the festivities beforehand, I was really, really immersed in the elite mindset of most of the runners who are there I was added to the Boston Facebook group and you know everybody's like 
downplaying. Somebody asked, are there pacers there? And they're like, no, like you're qualified to be here. There's still very much that mindset of the only way to run Boston is to qualify. Wait, so Boston doesn't have pacers at all? None. Okay. None at all. If you're watching this video, this is my shocked face. <laughs> And the reason, and honestly, and, and I will tell you, part of why I'm shocked is because everyone could benefit from a pacer if they want one. But also, you have a lot of charity runners and a lot of people who do this race that are not qualifying time runners that oh, I'm, I'm flabbergasted right now. They don't have pacers at all. And it's not no. like... It's not like there would be a lack of interest for right. patients for that race. Okay. 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 Continue. Well, I saw several comments about that in the Facebook group, but that mentality is still there that like, you should be qualified. You should be in great shape to run. You should be PRing the race. But the reality is that the history of this race, it was an elite performance for race. And I understand, yeah, why they didn't originally have pacers, but when they started blurring the lines and including charity and, you know, invitational bibs, I wasn't on a charity bib. I didn't have to ask for money. I was on an invitational bib. So I paid to be there and have this experience. I was guaranteed a spot, but not everybody is. And when you look at the entire field, the field is capped at just over 30,000, but only 22,000 of the qualifiers were there. That other quarter of the field is charity runners, invitational runners. So they are, they may or may not be in shape to run the, run the race when it comes around, especially oh. with the the qualifying window being 18 months, like you qualify and then a lot of life happens in 18 months, you may or may not be able to run. And so there, I saw a lot of those elite level athletes who were like, oh, well, I'm going to go run this, even though I'm injured or I, you know, I can't go and I'm injured and like, they weren't going to get there <laughs> nor some of them shouldn't have been there. Yeah. Okay. That's I'm, I'm, sh I'm feel like I shouldn't be surprised. And yet I am surprised. And I think you said it perfectly in terms of those blurred lines of who is this race for? And I get that the foundation was an elite event. And for me, I have been thinking a lot about this marathon, for those who don't know, it's part of the world marathon majors. So if you are someone who wants to get your six stars, which is Berlin, Tokyo, New York City, Chicago, London, and Boston, you have to run all six of those races. That's the thing that I have been pondering quite a bit over the past year or so of I've got, if I want to get my six star finisher, if I want to achieve that goal, which it is a goal of mine, I'm just so confused as to whether I actually want to achieve that goal because of everything, part of what we're talking about here. It's, it's that realization that Boston would have to be one of the races. And it's also that understanding that for me, I would probably have to be one of those charity runners because just where I'm at with running and the qualifying time I would have to get, it's there is there is a very big gap. And that gap does not equal a deep desire on my part <laughs> to close the gap. So that's part of something that, again, like I've been thinking about a lot lately. And honestly, the more I think about it, the more upset I get. Because in order for me to get these six stars, I would have to run this race that is, for those who don't know, it is like the only marathon major that does not operate on a lottery system. And it is the most expensive one when it comes to charity bibs. This year, charity bibs were between 7,500 and 10,000. And I also want people to know that even when you're running for charity, some charities still have you pay for your bib. I've had charities where I still have to pay whatever the entry is for the race on top of 
the amount that I have to, to do. So for me, it's not like I'm getting a free bib. It's not, <laughs> it's not. I've done plenty of fundraising. And I also know that fundraising is another job in and of itself. It is very, very, very challenging. And I think, I think the question I want to ask, and I want to ask this of Stephanie, um, you run so many marathons, right? And you've got 14 on, on plan for this year. Can you, I don't know, maybe dispel some of the allure of running the marathon majors, because there's a part of me that feels like it gets shoved down my throat how incredible the marathon majors are and how everyone should go after six stars. And even recently Abbott came out with like the graphics of how many six star finishers are and what all the things. So, I mean, I mean, their marketing team is great. I guess I just want to say their marketing team is great where I'm like, I want to be a part of that. But again, Steph, as someone who has ran multiple marathons, who your relationship to marathoning is above and beyond something like a six-star finisher. So can you, I don't know. Yeah. How, how, how do we, how do we see the reality behind the glitz and the glam of that? I love this question because to date I have run 42 full marathons. My first one um, in, in Torreon, Coahuila, Mexico, as I was there teaching third grade and international school uh, that, that was in 2012. And also I like to say that, um, remind people that I was not always a runner. I was, stood on the sidelines of a full marathon in 2011. And I was so floored by what I saw of all these different people, of all these different ages, of all these different body types, of all these different ethnicities there in the country of Mexico. And I had never even seen anything like it in my life. And I was so astonished that they had just run like 20 miles and we're not yet done. And I'd always said like, this body doesn't run because I'd always pictured in my mind that a runner looked one way or runner had to run one speed. But then all of a sudden I went from, well, why not me? And so I went from zero to 26.2 miles in a year. And I crossed that first marathon finish line in 2012 with my hands raised like victoriously in the air, like, oh my goodness, I just did that 26.2 miles. And so I think like for me, a marathon is again, just a celebration of what, what your body can do. So personally, I have not run a single world major marathon. So uh, uh, over the course of, uh, since 2012, 42 full marathons so far, I think there's been seven this year in 2024, um, no world majors because I, I, I almost, I'm torn, Stephanie, and I think I think you're kind of there too. I'm torn because I don't want to add to this to this elitist type mindset. Uh, again, I'm the one who's advocating that running is for everyone, all body sizes, all ethnicities, all paces. You run, you are a runner. Whether you're running a full marathon and you're doing run walk intervals whether you are running as much as you can and walking as needed, when you run, you're running a marathon. Because I think that's a debate too. Often I see on my reels is when I say I ran a marathon and I used 90 second run, 90 second walk intervals and people argue and say, well, you didn't run a marathon, you walked a marathon. And I said, no, like, so anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. So with, if given the chance, because I have, there's been some talk of, of Boston perhaps adding in pacers, which I think too, and then you'd have to look at, I know there's lots of different waves. And I think this is the other thing too, when you're not going back to the conversation of front of the pack versus back of the pack, the different race experience. Let's also talk about how back of the pack runners, the last corral, what time they're starting in the day and how that plays with your fueling strategy, with your race strategy, with the, with the heat and the temperature and spectators and et cetera, et cetera. So if you had pacers, you know, would there be what, what time or pace pacers, would there be like in each corral? But if I were given the opportunity to go and pace London Marathon or pace Berlin or, or to pace Boston, would I, would I go and do it? I mean, probably yes. But I, I think too, the whole idea of like for Boston Marathon, like you have these charity runners. I have, I have ran a marathon before with charity. And I know that I spent a lot of my own money for, for this charity um, marathon. And so I can imagine these, these charity runners for the Boston Marathon probably 
forked over a lot of their own money to donate to, to this charity. I mean, when you're saying 7,500 to $10,000, that's just like mind blowing. And to then to think that some of these charity runners are now being told, I mean, 500, over 500 runners are now being told your finish doesn't count. I cannot even begin to imagine the sinking feeling and how many of those people were going for that six star finish. And now, correct, like now some of these people are saying you you don't qualify for that six, six star medal because you you don't don't have an official finish time. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, that was so that was something that I I wanted to just touch upon. So thanks, Steph, for, for saying that because that was where my mind went immediately in terms of who are these back of the pack runners, who are these people that don't have an official finish time and chances are pretty, pretty high that they're your charity runners and that they are people who raised. And again, I'm saying 7,500 to 10,000 as the minimum. There are a lot of people who raise above and beyond that. So I can't imagine. I mean, I personally would be livid. It would take me, it would take me a really long time to get over the sting of, wait a minute, I just raised all this money for this organization to do this race. And I am there representing this organization at this race. And now you're going to tell me that even though I physically did it, I started and I finished that I'm not official. And there, like I've, I've read some stories of some people like they still got their medals. So you're, you're, you're walking away from the experience, having done the 26.2, having done the fundraising, having received a medal at the finish line only to find out that you're not official. Well, and, and you don't even find that out immediately. Like you have to wait for official results. It took me several days to be able to actually claim my star. Yeah. So they didn't walk across that mat and immediately be notified that their time didn't count. They finished, they got their medal. They thought they, okay, I'm done. I've done it only to be, essentially slapped in the face, proverbial, you know, speaking, and find out that it doesn't count. So the way they have to go back and do it again. So that was my thing, you know, because we have, it's yes, you've got BA, but then Abbott is also a separate entity. So I was wondering, I'm like, can these people take it up with Abbott as the organizer of the marathon majors and maybe file an appeal with them. I, I mean, I don't know how these different organizations work together, but it seems like, and again, some of the people were saying, it says it very clearly on their website that there's a six hour cutoff. But if you read the experiences of the people who were impacted by that six hour cutoff, a lot of them said that the vans that were picking up people, it wasn't very clear. It wasn't clearly communicated that they were nearing the cutoff time, that there were just failures of communication along the way. And I, I mean, again, I immediately thought of like a Disney race because, you know, Disney, they're famous for their balloon ladies, that it's really, really obvious. You can't miss them. The balloon ladies are famous. People love the balloon ladies, even as they're running away from them. And I guess that was another thing that struck me too, where, okay, I understand you have a course cutoff, but how clearly are things communicated to people that they're reaching the cutoff? Now, Steph, again, you are, are pacing on a sewer here. Can you tell us the races that you've paced? What does that sweeper or end of the course, what does that look like? Is it obvious? Is it not obvious? Because often like we're, we're, I've seen it. People are like, oh, but it was very clear and it was obvious. And I'm like, but was it, or could they have done something to make it more obvious? I, I don't know. So I'm hoping you can share with us something that I think a lot of people are missing when we're talking about this. Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to that conversation of what does that course cutoff time begin? Like, like, does it begin when the first person crosses the starting line or does it begin when the last per person crosses the starting line? Is this cutoff time based upon 
chip time or, you know, like bib time, because like my time, my course time starts when I cross that starting line often. And so again, um, I'll, I go back to the Big Sur Marathon because that's one of the races that I pace that has a very strict cutoff time. And usually there's, there's mile markers that have actually a physical clock that says you need to reach mile eight by you know, 10, 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. or whatever it is. And there's, there's a clock there. And so you are able to look and see, okay, how much of a cushion do I have? How much of a buffer mm -hmm. do I have? Because runners who pass that mark after that cutoff time, they, they are possibly going to be picked up by, by a van. And so again, there's, there's clear mile markers, mile like nine, mile 14, mile 22. This year for Big Sur, it was, a little, the course was a little bit different because there was a mudslide that took out part of the course. They had to alter the course. They did a great job of still having the race go on for, for runners who had planned to travel for Big Sur. And so it was an out and back where usually it's a point to point. And um, there, there was, clearly communicated that a mile 22, that was a final cutoff. And so again, me with my six hour pacing stick, people were running away from me and I tell runners all the time, it's okay. I'm not offended. If you run away from me, if you look behind <laughs> and you see me and you're like, ah, and you run away, I'm totally <laughs> used to that. And I'm going to, I'm going to cheer you on. Um, but, but again, that mile 22, there, there was a, a race official there who was like looking at his clock because I knew I needed to hit that mile mark at a certain time. And I knew I had my pacing band. So I knew I was on pace and I communicated with him. Hey, I have one minute cushion to my pace. So people who are behind me within that one minute, they are still making that cutoff time. And so again, um, I, as a pacer, which again, I'm so floored that if Boston has a strict six hour cutoff, there should be someone physically there on course communicating with runners, communicating with volunteers, because you're right, it is about communication, because it's not just about communication of the runners, but communication of volunteers, communication of other race officials on the course. Everyone needs to be on the same page, but it helps a lot to have a six hour pacer out there to communicate, to say, hey, we're at mile 22, I have a one minute cushion, um, and I've been on the course for this amount of time, and these people around me are meeting that six hour cutoff. Yeah, in the aftermath of all of this, and I didn't know this about the Tokyo Marathon, that they have at every 5K, apparently there's kind there's cutoffs that if you don't reach the 5K by a certain time, that's it. Like your race experience is done. And even last fall when I ran Marine Corps Marathon, it was the same thing. They communicated very, very clearly. I knew it. People who were tracking me knew it, that I had to reach two different points on the course by a certain time in order to finish. Now, last year was a little bit special because they closed the course or it was hotter than normal for that race. So they were actually shutting off those, those cutoff points a half hour earlier I didn't even know this was happening. It didn't, I, again, I was, I guess I was one of those people that was far, far enough ahead of time that it didn't impact me, but I definitely had friends texting me with, did you make it to the cutoff? Are you okay? And I didn't realize what happened until I finished. And I know in the aftermath, I heard a lot of people saying that they were really upset, but in that case, they were upset because they were diverted. Like they were, they were taken off the course. They did a modified course, taken off the course. So I think it's, it, to me, I'm not a race director, but it doesn't seem like that's, that's a really hard thing to add to a race to ensure that everyone has the same opportunity to finish. One of the other things, and Becky, I'm curious if you can speak to this because I saw this comment and it infuriated me, but it was someone, I went down the rabbit hole of just different people sharing about how they, they were one of the runners that did not, were not official finishers. And in the comments, um, this person talked about how there were other runners that had a finish time of over seven hours, but that their finish time was official because they started so far ahead that they still finished before the course cutoff time. So I'm just curious what, you know, I, I mean, okay, at this point, now that I put it out there, I want to, I want to hear both of your opinions because Steph, you were shaking your head and I know Becky's going to have some thoughts. So I'm just curious what you all think about something like that. 
So when I was on course, it was not clearly communicated where I saw what the cutoff times were. I think I was probably in the neighborhood of Heartbreak Hill when I saw course closes at 5.30 p.m. or even beyond that. But I didn't know what time it was. As an invitational bib, I started in wave four, corral seven. So I was near the absolute far end of the back. <laughs> but, and I ran a very strong race for quite some time, but it got toasty. So, but I didn't see that marquee and only one of them until late in the race. And I was like, well, I'm looking at, you know, my normal data. I'm looking at how many miles I'm in, what pace I'm at in, I'm I'm not flipping through to go, oh, what time of day is it? Like I could have been, because I was there for a good time. I was not there for a PR time. I walked a lot of Heartbreak Hill in meditation and I could have been very close to not getting that star. But how is, how is someone at the back of the pack with a five or six hour time not official, but someone in the front of the pack with a seven hour time is that's exceptionally unfair. Again, well, the blurred lines and the, the lack of communication surrounding what makes you an official finisher was a huge, huge problem. And I think what that lends itself to is the slower runners will then want to start in an earlier wave or an earlier corral, because then they're going to say, okay, well, if I start in an earlier wave or an earlier corral, then I'll have longer that I can finish the race. And so that's why, again, I think it needs to be clearly stated. Are you going off of clock time? Uh, wh wh what is the six hour mark? Because then I know runners... Like I I'll, I'll absolutely tell runners they should start in the corral or with the pace group that they believe is their finish time. They shouldn't try to go up to the front to give themselves more time because then that's what it's going to do is, is, is clog, clog the roadway for people who are running faster. So absolutely back of the pack should be starting with their, with their correct paces. But that absolutely is incredibly unfair. If I were trying to go for my six star and I see a runner who has a time of over seven hours and they were able to get an official time because they started an earlier wave or an earlier corral, that just is mind blowing to me. Yeah. That was something that I saw and I, it shocked me, but at the same time, I'm like, I, I know I've had races like that where I think I am fit enough to start and finish in a certain time. And then I, you know, to like where it's, oh gosh, I mean, yeah, it's just happened to me where I'm in a corral where I think I can do this in this amount of time. Then I start the race and I realize absolutely not going to happen today. And I end up holding on for dear life and I enter survival mode and I finish a lot, just a lot later. I mean, Marine Corps, I, I, that's a perfect example. Marine Corps, that is the race that I was hoping to run in 430. That was my goal. I thought that would be my challenging but comfortable pace. I went to that 430 pace group and I'm like, I should be good here. I should be fine. No, within the first five miles, I realized I am not fine. <laughs> this is not gonna, this is gonna be probably a little more challenging. And then at mile 10, I had just a complete breakdown, just lots of grief because life had been really hard up until that point. And apparently in a marathon is when my mind decided to just let it all out. And my heart just cracked open on that course. And I ended up finishing five hours and something. So I'm one of those people where it's like, I benefited from starting in where I thought I was because that did provide me the buffer of even if I slowed down and finished half an hour later, I was still okay. I was still meeting those checkpoints. So I think there's also that piece of it of, we are all hoping we're gonna get to race day feeling really well and that we're gonna meet our goals. But depending on where we start, that does change how much of a buffer we have to finish. And well, can, I just wanna interrupt for a sec yeah. to speak to that because not only were many other people at Boston affected by that, um, who had, you know, requalified and were still placed in a, a further back corral. I have run marathons in the three, four and five hour ranges. 
and I was put in the very back and I really pace wise had I been put in where I should be in the corral it should have been at least another wave ahead so nobody's speaking about how some of these athletes really should have been in different waves based on their actual fitness compared to like you know charity runners maybe they are fast runners but they're put in the back of the pack me being in wave four they're like oh party corral we love our charity runners I wasn't a charity runner like you're you're making it try to sound all inspiring but you're also like you have no idea who's in that corral Okay. And there were charity athletes throughout the other waves. All right. So now, the, okay. I, I just, I'm going to highlight something you said, because often, again, the elitism with this race will, will really, it, it'll have you running in circles. Can you clarify as in a runner with an invitational bib, where did you start? Because I, I started, feel like, go I ahead. I started in the back of the pack. Okay. I just wanted to yeah, highlight I didn't have a qualifying time. However, a year ago, I ran a three hour and 57 minute marathon, but I was put with five and six hour marathoners. Okay. So then I'm going to ask another question. Not sure if you know this. And because most races, you can put your expected finish time and then they will, for the most part, like races will kind of honor that and yeah. seed you according to what you said. The bigger the race, I find that it's harder for them to do that. But smaller races, I know if, if I put, I expect to finish in this time, chances are very, very good that I'm going to be put in a corral with people that are expected to finish around that time. But with Boston, am, am I understanding this correctly, that you're only really seated by a start time according to what your qualifying time is? And then charity runners, invitational runners are back of the pack? Well, mostly back of the pack. There were other charity runners further up in other corrals for whatever reason. And maybe those were more of those influencer type invitational bibs. I don't really know. But yeah, they were all just kind of thrown in the back. Here you go, party pace. And I was just listed as unqualified. I didn't have a qualifying time. Interesting. So it's like even going into the race, <laughs> you're, you're labeled as unqualified before even getting there. Um, but that's also, again, I think speaks a lot to what we're talking about in terms of where you start impacts what your experience is. And it also impacts what information you're getting along the course while you're on the course. Like it's not even and Steph hearing you speak, I'm thinking pacers aren't just to pace you. Pacers are also valuable on the course information as to what the rules of finishing the race are, because I saw people going to, you know, that the internet is a wild place, but I saw people going to the BAA website and like screenshotting. It clearly says six hour finish, but I'm hearing conflicting things. You're telling me it's a six hour finish, but then there's a hard stop at five 30. Like, I, as a runner, I would rather you tell me course closes at 5.30 p.m. I'd rather have that. And then I would actually, yeah, go through the hassle. And it's it's not really a hassle, but for us runners, when we're in a race, it is a hassle to go through your watch and change the settings to see the time. I would much rather, and I think that's one of the things I appreciated about Marine Corps, it was very clear. Like, it was odd times and I'm almost positive Big Sur this year was the same thing where it was like, you have to reach mile 21 by 11.23 a.m. or something like that. Like, I just remember seeing that and thinking, who comes up with these times? But for Marine Corps, it was that. It's you had to reach this mile by this time, that mile by that time. And you knew, I knew that if I, I believe it was mile 21 was the last cutoff, that I knew if I reach that mile, I'm going to finish this race regardless because I've finished that race. So here I'm just confused as to how both of those are existing in this one race. And then it feels like people are not all people, 
but then pointing the fingers at the runners themselves for not understanding. I mean, there's and a lot of great communication with Boston. It was well organized in a lot of ways. But I won't say that communication about course closures was clear at all. Yeah, I mean, and that's disappointing because it's it's a race that's been going on for long enough, which is why I found this particular aspect of it so fascinating this year, because obviously hearing people talk about it this year, I understood that it's happened to runners in previous years, just for whatever reason, it, it actually caught on runners world wrote their article about it. Like it actually caught on this year and it honestly it just, it was so for me, it was very, very upsetting and just further contributed to the elitism behind this race. And Again, my own confusion of, oh, if I want to get my six stars, what does it say about me that I want this goal? And in order to get that goal, I have to participate in this race that at this point is in many ways, I have a lot of you know respect for the people who run it and get their qualifying times and who work really hard to do that. But at the same time, the race itself is so against or at odds of everything that I stand for when it comes to believing this sport is for everyone. And that if you say you want to run Boston, then you should have that opportunity to run Boston. But hearing about what happened this year, it's like, crap. I want to curse. I won't. I stopped myself there. But it's like Boston doesn't deserve you is how I, I feel. I kind of came to this whole thought process a few years ago myself. And I was in the middle of summer running and I'm a lot like you, Stephanie, like I shut down in the heat and humidity because our weather is very similar. Only I get triple digits for weeks on end. <laughs> but I was listening to a podcast and all of a sudden I was like, why do I want to run this race? Why do I want to meet a standard that somebody else set? This is like an arbitrary goal. This doesn't say anything about me, who I am, my worth, anything like that. And it actually really allowed me to take a lot of pressure off of myself because I was really like struggling and, and only taking maybe 10 to 12 minutes off of each one of my marathons at that point. And I was still learning a lot as an athlete, but I, I kind of took a step back and really enjoyed running and like, let it be more of a moving meditation again and it be mine. And then um, I went and ran Wilmington and I took 25 and a half minutes off my time. And I was like, oh, now I'm really close. I think I could do this. But it's still like it's challenging me and my performance and my goals. And, you know, it's great to be a driver for that. But going and having this experience in Boston, I have told anybody I've talked to, they're like, how was it? Did you love it? And I'm like, no, I actually really didn't love it the way that elite runners love it. And I didn't walk away from a different mindset about this mm. space as a whole. And I can go take that seven minutes off of my time and be qualified. And I don't plan on going back. I'm not going to say never, but I don't have any intentions. Like I'm qualified. That's great. I still want to keep pushing and driving. And I still have like major goal times in mind, but you know, I had to drop probably nearly three grand to be there. And the people who do this, you know, 10, 12, 17, 20 years in a row who are like, oh, I'll never not run Boston. I'm like, you're just taking spaces away from other people who could have the experience one time and go on. Yeah. Listen, I, I don't know if either of you have read Running Wall Black by Allison Mariella Desir. And in there, she talks about her Boston experience and how she expected to finish feeling like her life had changed 
And when she did, it didn't. She was like, this, that, that was it. Like for her, it was. And I find that I feel that every single year when, I mean, multiple times throughout a year. And again, like I, I want to say, I want to be very clear. I have so much respect and admiration for people who, who Boston qualifying is their goal. But at the same time, I'm like, but, but what makes it so special? Like what, what really is it that makes it so special? Like how is your life going to change from this experience? That's kind of, that's always my question. And that's where after reading her, her description of it, and I even told her, I was like, I was like, I'm afraid if I ever run it, I am going to be disappointed. Like, I am going to be like, eh, I don't get what the hype is about. Like, and it's, and it's, and it feels weird because when you hear people talk about it, and now I need to start paying a little bit more attention of like, like, are the people who are talking so greatly about the race, are those people who have qualified to run the race? Or the people who are talking so greatly about the race, are those the charity runners or invitational bids? Like, I need to pay a little more attention to that now going forward after talking to you two, because that's, that really is where, where I'm at of understanding for myself that running a marathon is really, really hard. Like even under best conditions, it is a hard experience on the body, on the mind, on the soul. And is that where I'm going to want to put my whole self through to experience something that might not, I guess, reinvigorate my love. I think that's it. I'm just in, I'm in a space of, I want to run races that are going to reinvigorate my love of running. I will say the one thing that I thought was different and special about Boston is that course is lined from start to finish almost entirely with the most amazing support. Um, I came around, um, off of heartbreak and saw the pioneers and the trailblazers and Vanessa and she ran and caught up with me and grabbed me and hugged me. And that was the best, but like all along, like you could get them to hype you up and you know, they just did not stop. That was phenomenal. But aside from that, it's another marathon and they're hard, they're humbling and they owe you nothing. Yeah. I Stephanie, I do I do want to talk just just briefly about what you were mentioning um again just about like the elitism of Boston for me myself too I I'm hesitant to want to run Boston with a charity bib I I'm a far cry even from my marathon PR of qualifying for Boston um do I will I say never I'm I'm not going to say never but um I don't foresee myself anytime in the near future going for a qualifying time for Boston but I also don't feel like I would want to go and run with a charity bib personally, because I wonder how many charity bib runners who are far cry from, from earning a Boston qualifying time feel as though they're judged in that Boston Marathon weekend, judged based upon people looking at them like, oh, well, you're not a qualifier. Oh, you don't belong here. And so again, just that that whole mindset, I'm not going to want to put myself voluntarily in that experience because already I'll tell you, holding a six hour marathon pace sign for CIM for the California International Marathon, this is probably one of my proudest running accomplishments is being the very first six hour pacer for CIM um, and holding that six hour sign is a little bit different because it just says six colon zero zero. So some people think, oh, are you, are you running six minute miles? And some people will like, look at me and they're like, you don't run a six minute mile. And so again, just, I think that, um, judgment of someone is really defeating. Now I'm someone that I have a, a, a pretty thick skin. So there's not much that can really get me down, but for other runners who are new runners, and who are in the back of the pack and the 1344 pace per mile is their best, is their hard, they are not going to want to be surrounded with that mindset of that you don't belong in this space. And so again, I think that's why I am someone who I'm not quick to want to go and to run the Boston Marathon. I, I'll share one of my athletes actually was in Boston with me and she hired me specifically so that she could attempt to complete it without being swept. That was her whole goal. It was, you know, this is my first marathon. I want to do this. I want to do it right. And 
she actually got pregnant mid cycle. And so it totally threw off. She was like, surprise, unexpected baby. And she's got two littles. So I was like, oh, okay. So things are going to change a little bit, but she still had a solid chance of doing really well. And it wasn't until this, the last month that her doctor was like, I don't want you to go beyond half. And she raised nearly $10,000 for charity. She didn't feel like she should be there. And I had to keep reminding her, you deserve to be there as much as anybody else. Yeah, that, I think that's part of what breaks my heart so much. And I know all of us will probably, you'll all probably agree with me that we love this sport so much that we want everyone to do it, right? We want everyone to experience being a runner and it hurts when there are those things that they say, well, I can't do it because I'm not a real runner or I don't look like a runner or I don't run fast enough or I take walk breaks. And it's like, no, none of that, none of that. And to, again, there's so much of, is this race really a great race or are just people really vocal about their love of it. Right. And again, for me now it's, I'm going to start paying more attention to are the people who are proclaiming, this is such a great race. Are they people who qualified for the race or are they people who have charity bibs and what, how is that experience different? Because I mean, even just, you know, the gear for it sometimes where it's like, you have like the jackets to say Boston qualifier. And it's like, okay, that stuff is great, but also what about the people who don't? And and it's I find that it's such a tricky conversation to have because if you qualify for the race, like it's great. Like you should be proud of that as well. Like you should be proud of what you're doing, but also does that signal to someone else that they shouldn't be there or that their experience or what they're doing isn't as quote unquote good as someone else's. And that's, I think I struggle a lot with that of how do we hold both things at the same time? And I, think I really struggled with how Tracksmith handled that because oh. <laughs> they put out the, the super elite singlet. You had to be a qualifier and you had to be accepted and I saw a lot of people talking about it in the Boston group. And I was like, I already had feelings about Tracksmith and I won't support them. They, they have a history, but they really fuel that whole mindset around your, you only belong here if you're elite. Which is so unfair. And I, I try to tell people this too, that the, the, how people get into the Boston marathon is a very unfair practice because it is a target that moves from year to year. It's not like it's clearly communicated that 22,000 runners with qualifying times are going to get in. You don't know, right? Like you get a qualifying time and you hope you have enough of a buffer because at this point, everyone knows qualifying time is not enough to get you a spot into Boston. You need to have a buffer. You need to have run X amount of minutes faster than whatever it says your qualifying time is. And then you have to verify your time. And even then you don't know if you got in until afterwards. And then it almost seems like, you know, on behalf of the race, like there, there is a bit of a, of a pride thing that comes with, Oh, the buffer this year was five minutes and 33 seconds. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, if you were at five minutes and 34 seconds, you're, you're shut out. And you got the qualifying time, but now you can't be there. And then Tracksmith is saying, we've got this special tank, but you have to qualify and get in. And getting in isn't even something you could have controlled because it's the organizers that are controlling that. And then on top of that, we have that layer of, oh, well, more qualifying people didn't get in because of the charity bids, because those charity bids are taking away from people who earned a time. And I remember thinking, hearing that and seeing that and thinking, but both people have earned their way to the race, either through time or through fundraising, a lot of money. 
Both people have earned their way into this race by committing to the training. Now, that is even more upsetting because those people who earned their way into this race by fundraising, some of them have not technically earned their medal because they didn't finish by a time that wasn't, I even wrote it down here. Like we came up with like three really good things here where it's like have pacers, there's no pacers, have course cutoffs where race officials are communicating clearly on the course and then have clear course closures beforehand. Just communicate that. This is a race that's been happening for so long. I mean, I can't even imagine the data these people have at their disposal. You're going to tell me that with 120 something years of data, you haven't determined that by 5.30 p.m. on Marathon Monday, that's the rate, that's the time that it should close regardless, right? Like, unless they're delaying it, I just think they've got so much data. How could they not see a pattern in closures for the course throughout the years? You know, even something like that. So it just, oh, and the other thing was the, that, even communicating clearly stuff, which you brought up, the difference between whether the course cutoff is based on clock time or your chip time. But again, that ties into how is that time being communicated? Can we have some firmer numbers when it comes to when this course is done, when you have to be done with your race in order to be considered an official finisher? And I should add another one too. Becky, based off of your experience where you didn't even find out until days later what your like official time was. So imagine all those people who celebrated, got their medal, were really proud, and then they're finding out that, hey, your name actually doesn't show up in the official finishers, so you're not an official finisher. Like, are you kidding me? So we've talked about quite a, quite a lot of things. I have three final questions for both of you. And probably be familiar with these questions. Well, at least the last one. But the first question I have for both of you is just what message do you have for those runners who are considered unofficial finishers this year? I would say don't let somebody else's rules define your worth. You know that you did it. Your body did it. You finished it. Um, and maybe let that reframe how you approach these type of elite events in the future. I mean, if we aren't going to be part of the solution, then we don't have to be part of the problem either. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, actually, I know one of um, a fellow Brooks ambassador, a fellow Brooks collective ambassador um, teammate, she she ran the Boston Marathon and she is among one of those unofficial finishers. And I'm speaking directly to her right now and to those other runners too. Just again, echoing what Becky just said, this does not define your worth. It does not define you as a runner. Do not allow this to taint your love of the sport and of the running community. And I am proudly standing next to you and proclaiming that all runners count, including you. Mm -hmm. Second question is, what message do you have for the runners out there that do have Boston on their bucket list? I think that you can let it be a goal that drives you to be a better runner and whatever that means for you, um, that's individual. But this is not the end all be all race. It's tainted in history, but it's not tainted in good history. I have a very unique um, view of this race as an indigenous runner. And I may have only been one of maybe a dozen on course. I don't know. I can't find that data, hmm. but we can go out there and we can represent our culture and show others we're there, or we can go run in prayer elsewhere. To those that have Boston on their bucket list, whether you're looking to qualify or whether you know that you're going to be raising money for charity, um, don't allow this goal to 
make you fall out of love with running. So again, if you're trying to Boston qualify and you're working hard and you're, you, you happen to get injured, know again that um, this does not define you as a runner. If you don't get that Boston qualifying time, or if you if you run a marathon and you earn that BQ, but then you don't get into Boston because of that buffer, I hope that it doesn't um, again paint your view of running. May you continue to run for the joy of it, for the challenge of it. Um, that's my message to you. Yeah, thank you both. Last question is just. Becky, I know you've got Chicago coming up. Steph, you said you've ran seven, so you've got seven more marathons coming up. And I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if you pop up somewhere else. So, well, you know, I'm not, I'm just going to leave it at that. So the final question is, if you can both just share how we can better connect with you beyond this episode. Obviously, you can find me at coach.croft. Um, I'm very posty there. It does lead to the other avenues of communication, um, but that's where I, you'll most likely find me. And you can find me on Instagram as my main platform. Uh, my handle is run strong run. And again, I am your marathon pacer, number one cheerleader. You can also find me on my website, runstrongrun.com and the newly launched podcast, the Run Strong Run podcast, where I am telling the inspiring stories of the runners of the back of the pack, loudly proclaiming that all runners count. Yeah. And I hope that if you've listened to this episode and you've heard our thoughts, that it's helping you think about things a little bit differently and helping you see that we all have a role to play in making sure that runners all feel like they count not only that they do count but that mm -hmm. we're doing what we can so that they feel like they are a part of this runner space and I truly do believe that the gatekeeping ways of running I don't think they're over but I feel like we're starting to see cracks in those doors of how are we how are we actually saying running is for everyone when we're not doing the things to align with those words. So yeah, I want to thank you both for being here and for talking to me about this and for sharing your wisdom and for allowing me to be curious in my questions with each of you. So everyone, we'll see you on the next episode whenever it comes out. See y'all soon. Bye. Bye.